Thank you, Leo, and thank you very warmly for the invitation. It is a great pleasure to be with you uh, at this great university, and I'm especially happy to be at the Ravignani Institute. Thanks to all of you for coming. I'm very happy to have the chance to speak with you about a book that is almost finished, but there is still enough time that if you think I've made mistakes, you can tell me and I can fix them, <laughs> right? So I need you. Uh, let me also mention that uh, I will, I'm from the southern part of the U.S., so I was brought up to speak slowly. But if I, start, if I get excited and start speaking too quickly, we have Leah and Paulino to help. So if I'm going too fast or if anything's not clear, just raise your hand and they will help us. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Okay, so let me begin by telling you something about the strange path that I took in writing this book. The origins of this book go back more than 30 years. When I was writing and researching this book with Peter Leinbaugh, and in doing that research, I started reading advertisements placed in newspapers by enslavers whose enslaved people had run away. This was very common in early America, very common everywhere there was slavery, yes? But I kept seeing a, a repetition in these advertisements. It would say, masters of vessels are warned not to take this person on board. Or another phrase that came up frequently, this runaway was last seen in the company of sailors. So I thought, something is going on here. So I went and read all of the great historical literature on the Underground Railroad, which is about how people escaped slavery. And almost none of it was about escaping by sea. Almost none of it. So that presented a mystery. And that's going to be part of the uh, content of this talk, to pose the question, why have these runaways been invisible? And I can tell you now, I didn't know then, but I can tell you now that probably 15 to 20,000 people escaped by sea. That, that is many millions of dollars worth of property that Southern enslavers lost. So question one, I want to try to, pose in this lecture is, why haven't we known about this? And the second question is, once we learn about it, what does it matter? Why is it significant? So those are, those are two issues. Now, I should also say this book is in many ways a sequel to another book that I wrote called The Slave Ship. A Human History, which was published in Spanish, I think, three or four years ago, originally published in the year 2007. So this book is now called Freedom Ship, because the descendants of the people who were brought to America on ships like this, this is a slave ship, by the way, the, the descendants of those people turned that ship into an instrument of freedom. And then this, I think, is a very important story. Okay, so, as I'm sure everyone here knows, the Atlantic slave system was a critical part of the rise of global capitalism. In the United States, there were roughly 2 million people enslaved in 1830, and by 1860, the number had grown to 4 million. These people produced tobacco, rice, and most importantly, cotton, which was critical to the Industrial Revolution, whose cutting edge was textiles. Okay, now, 
for a long time, going back to Adam Smith, we were taught that slavery had nothing to do with capitalism, that it was in fact an impediment, an obstacle. But thanks to recent research, we now know that is not true. The Atlantic slave system was critical to the rise of capitalism. And so what I want to talk about is the way in which slave resistance was linked to some of the structures in the rise of capitalism. And let me give you a graphic illustration. This is a, a, an image produced by someone named Ben Schmidt in which he took ship logs, the, the record that ship captains kept of their voyages, and every single line represents a voyage. Okay, can I get up? Yeah. Just, okay, I, I, I want to draw your attention to something right here. Okay, here, as you know, is South America. Here's the eastern coast of North America. And what I want to draw your attention to is the very dark, thick line between northern North America and southern North America. There are thousands and thousands of voyages going from northern ports to southern ports and then returning to northern ports and every one of those lines represents an opportunity for someone to escape. Okay? So my point here is that the structure of trade, literally the hundreds and thousands of ships that are going into these southern ports, into Charleston, South Carolina, or Savannah, Georgia, or Norfolk, Virginia. The structure of trade makes possible the structure of resistance, mm. the structure of escape. Okay, so this is, this, is a, this is a very important point. Now, my story begins in roughly 1829 or 1830, it begins really with a, a, a specific event, the publication of a book by a black American abolitionist named David Walker. And you can see here he published Walker's Appeal. This is a revolutionary tract that calls on the enslaved people of the Americas to follow the example of the revolution in Haiti. He says, rise up and destroy slavery. And he says this in a really vivid, biblical way. So this begins a new era of Atlantic resistance. Now, what's especially fascinating about David Walker is that he is a man of the waterfront. He has a clothing business. He sells clothing to sailors. So you see a group of sailors here on the right, and you can see a racist caricature of a black sailor hmm. at the left. But here's the important point. There were lots of black sailors in this time period. Many, many black sailors. So what David Walker would do is he would create a secret compartment in the sailor's clothing where he would put copies of his book. <laughs> And then the sailors would go ashore in Charleston or Norfolk, and they would go among the enslaved people and say, here, here, pass this around, here, here, here. To use sailors mm -hmm. to circulate the revolutionary message. So this is, a, this is a very important event. Partly as a result of David Walker's book, the 1830s becomes a period of extraordinary slave resistance. There are uprisings almost everywhere. Mm. A famous mm -hmm. one in the United States is Nat Turner's revolt mm. in 1831. There are other big revolts in Jamaica, in Brazil, mm. in many other places. Great Britain is abolishing slavery in its colonies in two stages, 1834 and 1838. So this is a period of tremendous resistance. And in this period, 
running away from slavery or sailing away from slavery acquires a new political power. Now, the enslavers who found David Walker's book in their own population, they were absolutely furious. So they started passing laws to make it impossible for black sailors to go among the slave population. These were called the Negro Seamen Acts. Every southern state passed one, partly because of the danger of the circulation of radical ideas, radical anti-slavery ideas. So, so basically, my project is to study these five southern Atlantic ports, uh, Savannah, Georgia, Charleston, South Carolina, Wilmington, North Carolina, Norfolk, Virginia, Baltimore, Maryland, all in slave states, and then the four northern ports, Philadelphia, New York, New Bedford, Massachusetts, and Boston, Massachusetts, which is where most of the vessels went. Okay, so this is the system. Mm -hmm. This is the Atlantic system. Okay, so I don't have to tell all of you Porteños <laughs> that port cities are something special. Mm -hmm. They're something unusual. Mm -hmm. They are really a special kind of place. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I have some colleagues in Liverpool who say that the people who live in port cities have much more in common with each other mm -hmm. than they do with people mm -hmm. in their own hinterlands. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because they're all cosmopolitan. True. They're accustomed to international trade. Okay, so the port city, and specifically the docks of the port city, are critical to this study. Because what happens is these connections among different kinds of workers in the ports makes the waterfront a battle zone. A battle zone in which people are escaping slavery, and, of course, the authorities are doing everything they can to prevent it. But look at this image of New York. This is the Hudson River docks, mm -hmm. 1860s. How do you control that? Mm -hmm. It's really difficult to control that. You see the many different kinds of work being done, the different kinds of workers, cooperation. Okay, so the docks are a strategic location in the rise of global capitalism. Very dangerous place where people come and go with the tides, but a place that is critical to the world market of commodities. Because the hinterlands ship their commodities to the port city, where they are loaded onto ships and taken to some other part of the world. Right? So these port city workers who move hogsheads of tobacco or barrels of rice or bales of cotton, their cooperative labor is absolutely crucial to the functioning of global capitalism. It won't work without their labor. And they are consistently called a motley crew. What would be the Spanish for that? Motley. Motley crew. Um, Multi-ethnic. Yeah, multi-ethnic. Um, Sí, una, una multitud, eh, eso, claro, variopinta. Ajá, variopinta, good. Okay, so, so we're getting closer. These workers are crucial to capitalist commodity chains. You think about how they circulate. You know, I, I, forgive me, Leo, but a lot of economic historians pretend that commodities circulate by themselves. Yeah. <laughs> but they don't. Not really. <laughs> they don't. There are workers moving them at every step of the way. But that labor is frequently invisible. Okay, so now, as I've said, we look at this from below in terms of the, the fugitives and the sailors. I'm going to tell you more about the players in just a minute. But we've got to look at it from above, from the point of view of the people who are trying to prevent these escapes. Okay? It's a really difficult thing. So this, this history that I'm writing is also a history of policing. 
policing, policing. formation of police forces mm -hmm. to prevent the cooperation that will lead to escape. These uh, police take many forms uh, in one city or another. They are called uh, guards, constables, customs officers. They're called the watch. They're called police. And then in other cities like New York, just like this, there is also a police force of people who are trying to catch runaways and send them back to the South mm -hmm. to collect the rewards. Those people are called blackbirders, <laughs> meaning they go after the black workers who have escaped mm -hmm. and they take them back and they make a lot of money in taking them back. It's also true that in a place like New York, tremendous investment in Southern cotton. So the ruling class of New York, especially the merchants, are very eager to see these runaways go back. Okay, so, so there's a, a concentrated power against the people who escape and the people who escape by sea. It's very dangerous, it's very difficult. Okay, so who are the players in this, in this uh, uh, story of escape? Who are the historical agents? Well, the first player is the fugitive, him or herself. The person who tries to find a way to get on board a vessel and make it to a northern port. They are the most crucial players. Some of them are escapees from plantations. Many of them are enslaved people who work in the port cities. Okay? The second crucial actor in all of this is the sailor. Because the sailor is the person who can help to get you aboard a ship. We're looking here at an image of probably the most famous abolitionist in 19th century American history, Frederick Douglass, who dressed up as a sailor mm. and carried a sailor's freedom certificate in order to escape Maryland, his native Maryland. And here he is dressed up as a sailor. Frederick Douglass was a man of the waterfront. He worked along the waterfront. He was in contact with sailors and dock workers all the time. He was a skilled artisan. He was a caulker. Okay, another crucial player in all this is, oops, sorry, is the dock worker. These are black dock workers from Charleston, South Carolina. They load and unload the ships. It's very easy for them to say to a fugitive, okay, I'm gonna stow this cotton these bales of cotton, will there be a small space in between? You get in there. You hide there. Okay? Mm -hmm. the, the man that you see here in the lower right, th these were drawn by a British artist named uh, uh, Crow, Crow Air. And this man actually says, now get this, we, we don't know why he said this, but he says here, I be on the docks all the time, I didn't see nothing. It's almost like somebody was asking him about a runaway, and mm -hmm. I didn't see nothing. <laughs> so you cover for people. You help them. You mm -hmm. show your solidarity. Okay? So that's another player. And then here's one that may be surprising to you. Market women. All of the ports were full of market women selling all kinds of things. Fresh food. This woman has carrots and some other vegetables. They also sold cakes. They sold corn. They sold uh, meat of various kinds, frequently to sailors who come into port with money and they're hungry. Mm -hmm. So to give you an example of how this worked, this is, uh, this is a painting by an artist named uh, uh, John Waterman Wood. This is a market woman from Baltimore. This is her port here on the left. Let me tell you what a northern abolitionist said about this. He said this, he said, a market woman would go aboard a ship with fresh pies and fresh fruit. They frequently went aboard the ship. Nobody was suspicious. Mm -hmm. And when she get on board the ship, she would ask the sailors if there was a fugitive on board. Then she would leave the ship and come back ashore and take that information to the abolitionists. 
who would then organize a group of people to go and rescue that fugitive. Okay, so market women play a very important part. So, so my point is that the Motley crew is multi-ethnic, is cosmopolitan, is international, and is really occupying a strategic position for the circulation of knowledge and the circulation of resistance. Okay, we need to see resistance as something that moves. Okay? All right, now, despite all of these difficulties that fugitives might have getting on board the ship, there were some forces working in their favor. For example, some ship captains came into port needing labor. Some sailors had deserted, some sailors had gotten sick, and sometimes that captain might hire a fugitive, no questions asked. <laughs> Just shh, come on. A second thing, a countervailing force, is that a lot of enslaved people worked on the waterfront, and so they had maritime skills. So people could show up and say, sure, I know how to run a ship. You're hired. Mm -hmm. That makes it easier. A third thing is that by the 1850s, not a majority, but a significant minority of ship captains, northern ship captains, had become convinced abolitionists. So some of them would seek to, to bring enslaved people on board. I have one instance where a captain managed to hire 26 people in a fairly small vessel. That was kind of a legendary escape. Okay, and of course, the other countervailing force is the motley crew, sympathetic sailors, dockers, who can help you to stow away. And then finally, I should mention, <coughs> the key figure in all that are black sailors. They're the ones who are the most sympathetic, but there are a lot of white sailors who are helping black escapees too. That needs to be said. And then another point we need to know is that in both the southern port and in the northern port where the vessels are going, there is a significant number of, of free black residents. People who have already escaped slavery in one place or another, and they are crucial to caring for the fugitives, <coughs> looking after them while they're looking for a ship, and then when they get to the northern ports, it's the black community who takes the runaway in and makes it possible for them to escape uh, uh, once and for all, for good. Okay, so here's my point for this part of the lecture. Labor cooperation in a place like this, labor cooperation is created by capital. These workers are brought together through the power of capital through organized cooperation. But once workers are cooperatively organized, those workers develop projects of their own, which the capitalist did not intend. So this is the two-sidedness of cooperation. Cooperation for the sake of profits, but also cooperation for the sake of resistance. Okay? All right, now I want to <coughs> talk to you about a particular figure, a man named William Powell. William Powell was born in 1807. He's an African American man from New York. His father was enslaved, and his mother was a Native American <coughs> or an indigenous person. So he, although he identified as black his entire life, it would be more precise to say that he was Afro-indigenous. Mm. Okay, and this is, this is actually very important to him. His wife is also an indigenous person, as are his children. So he, uh, William Powell, who I, I must admit, he's, he's not well known, and this is a problem because he's so crucial to this system of maritime escape 
Uh, he appears occasionally in books on abolition. He didn't write any books. He didn't leave any papers. But I discovered that he was a very active writer for abolitionist newspapers. And this godsend called the keyword search engine has allowed me to find hundreds of articles that he wrote. Okay? So, I know his whole life. He went to sea at the age of 20. He was living in New Bedford, Massachusetts at that time, in a very strong free black community. He went to sea for five years. We know that he went to the Caribbean. We know that he sailed to Brazil. And we know he took a, a whaling voyage into the Pacific Ocean. Those are usually two-year voyages. We know because he told us these things. In 1832, he opened a sailor's boarding house. A sailor's boarding house. A place where sailors, specifically black sailors, could come and stay between voyages. There was a lot of racism in the white boarding house. So he decided that he would open a black boarding house. He did this, uh, and then in 1839, he moved to New York, which is a much bigger port than New Bedford with a much bigger class of black sailors. Okay, So he moves to New York in 1839, and he opens a colored sailor's boarding house on the East River on the lower east side of Manhattan. This is a place where... News and information about resistance circulated. <laughs> There's a wonderful scholar named Julius Scott mm -hmm. who wrote a book called The Common Wind. It's about the way the news of the Haitian Revolution spread by sailors. Mm -hmm. Well, the common wind blew very hot and heavy in William Powell's boarding house. It was an abolitionist operation, but it was also a labor center. It was a shape-up hall for black workers whom Powell would help to get jobs. <coughs> okay, so he is a key player in this maritime system of escape, and I might also add that he and his fellow black sailors at the Colored Seamen's Boarding House also formed the first maritime trade union in United States history. Mm -hmm. So he's very labor conscious. He's a labor abolitionist. He's from below. Okay, so 1847, June 27th, 1847, a Brazilian ship called the Lembrança docks on the East River at Roosevelt, the Roosevelt Street docks. It's actually very close to right here. This is the Lower East Side of the East River. This is what it looked like. The Colored Sailors Boarding House was only about two blocks away. So a group of black dock workers go aboard this ship to unload a shipment of coffee. And when they're on the vessel, they discover there are three enslaved people. Two men and a woman. The woman is caring for the children of the captain. Now these black dock workers know that New York abolished slavery in 1827. And there was now a law that said any enslaved person who arrives in New York is now free. So the, the black dock workers do two things. They sort of build a wall around the ship and they send an emissary to get William Powell. He'll know what to do. And believe me, he knew what to do. This is absolutely brilliant. When Powell was told about the ship, he dressed as a merchant. <laughs> he dressed up, right? He's a seafaring man, but he dressed up as a merchant, and he walks down to the ship, and he walks aboard as if he is the receiving merchant of the cargo of coffee. Of course, he had nothing to do with that. But he walks around the ship, and he's look, you know, he was a sailor. He knew his way around. <coughs> so he's checking this and checking that, and he sees one of these enslaved men and he goes up to him, and he says to him, get this, in Portuguese, are you a slave? Now, the Motley crew, I said, is very cosmopolitan. 
William Powell had sailed to Brazil, spent some time there, and learned Portuguese. And the man said back to him, am I a slave? Yes, I am. And William Powell said, you won't be a slave for long. In fact, we'll have you off of this ship very soon. So now a bigger crowd of workers is surrounding their, the ship. And, and they're, they're, they're contemplating an armed rescue. Because this was very common, especially in New York. There were a number of armed rescues. But meanwhile, William Powell goes to another African-American man with the great name of Louis Napoleon. Get that. <laughs> He's a porter. He moves things around the docks. And he had this knack for going to the courts and getting a writ of habeas corpus, which basically is a writ saying someone has been illegally detained or imprisoned, which would then free those people. He got the writ. They brought the people before a judge. The judge actually sent them back to the ship. They got another writ. And then soon the men were taken into jail in New York. They weren't freed yet, but they were on their way. Okay, so they're in, the, they're in the Eldridge Street Jail. Now, here's something that is a really wild coincidence of historical research. I mean, this is wild. In this case involving this ship, Lebronza, we can see the story from the point of view of William Powell, who wrote about it actually many years later. But we can also see it from the point of view of the, one of the enslaved men that he helped to free. This is a man named... Mahama Bakwakwa, who was actually uh, an enslaved African. He had been born in Wida, excuse me, in, in a place called Jogu, near Wida, in the present day, uh, this was then the kingdom of Dahomey, now it's Benin. He made a middle passage to Pernambuco, Brazil. He was purchased by the ship captain and taken to Rio and then shipped out aboard the Limbranza to New York. After he was freed by William Powell, he wrote a spiritual autobiography and he describes this encounter with Powell and these abolitionists in New York. But it's important to know, Bakwakwa already knew that New York had abolished slavery. How he found out must have been the common wind. And he was already planning to run away in New York. But the problem was he only knew one word of English. Uh, an English sailor had taught him the word F-R-E-E, -E, free. This is what he was going to say to people when he got off the ship. <laughs> free, 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 right? Okay, so <clears throat> he published this book in 1854, seven years after the encounter. But let's go back to the jail. Okay? Mm -hmm. These two African men are in jail. The woman decided, probably under great duress, to go back to the ship, probably threatened by the captain. The men decided to remain in jail. Now, the next morning, the two men are missing. Their cell is empty. It's empty. New York City is abuzz with rumors. What happened? What, where did these men go? What happened? They said it must have been a miracle. And the <coughs> jailer said they must have gotten into an underground sewer. Mm. Well, mm. Not, none of that is what <laughs> happened. Turns out this was the result of a very well-organized abolitionist plot. It turns out that inside the jail was a white abolitionist who had been locked up for debt. And the word was gotten to him that he must help these two African men escape. So what does he do? He takes a bottle of brandy to the jailer's office and drinks the man into a total drunken stupor. And then he takes the keys, he goes to the cell, he opens the cell, the men come out, he goes to the main door of the prison, he opens the door, they go out, and they get onto a carriage that is waiting outside with several abolitionists, including William Powell in it, and off they go to Boston. This was the plan. 
This was the plan. This was, this, is, is, this is not a brilliant plan, right? So William Powell uh, uh, did all this. They, they put the men in Boston on a ship to Haiti, where they will be completely <laughs> beyond the reach of any slaveholders from Brazil or the United States or anywhere else. Now, uh, when, when Bakwakwa wrote his autobiography seven years later, he still had no idea what had actually happened to him. He said, this is what he wrote, he said, he described his good fortune by crediting God for, quote, raising up so many friends in a strange land. He thought it was an act of God. <laughs> Maybe it was. But the truth is that it was the result of a highly organized abolitionist movement. And William Powell, by the way, described himself as a, quote, friend of the slave. This was the language of solidarity. Okay, so just to sum up, note how the system of maritime escape worked. Black abolitionist dock workers and a motley crew of sailors connected the ships and the wharves and the freedom struggles over thousands of nautical miles from Brazil to New York to Boston to Haiti, and eventually Bacuacua would go on to Britain, Great Britain and Canada, so that all these maritime passages... This is kind of how it works, but we've never seen it. We've rarely seen it. Okay, so, so let me conclude. Why are these people who escape by sea so unknown? Why is that? I think there are a number of reasons. Some of them are fairly simple and straightforward. Everybody knows that escaping slavery was illegal. It was therefore clandestine and secret. And the perfect escape left no documentation. Mm. Okay, so, but lots of people escaped by land under the same circumstances, so that's not a sufficient explanation. Another reason why we know so little about this is that most historians who have written about slavery are not familiar with maritime sources. Mm. They don't really know much about ships. Uh, they didn't know that this was something that was so extremely important. The third thing, and this I think <coughs> is kind of significant, you know, these are images that were, these were the most common images of male and female runaways in the 19th century. And, and one of these or the other would frequently appear alongside the advertisement so that your eyes could be drawn, this is a runaway slave, okay? So here's a man, here's a woman on ground. The problem is, underground railroad is a metaphor. And all metaphors work by comparing things, but also by occluding from your vision other things. Now, I'm here to tell you that the Underground Railroad wasn't underground, and nor was it a railway. <clears throat> I mean, a few people escaped by railroad, but very, very few. It would be much more accurate to call it an overseas sailway or freeway, okay? But this, too, is not enough of an explanation. I think something else is going on, and here I want to mention a concept that I developed some years ago, it, I did it partly in jest. I kept fig, trying to figure out why it was that people didn't know the importance of the history, histories that happened at sea. And so I came up, I, I invented a word, and the word is called terra-centrism. <laughs> Land-based history. Yeah. Okay? Now, the corollary <laughs> of all this is that History happens on land, in nation states. And so the implicit assumption, this is a largely unconscious bias. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. But the corollary is that history doesn't happen at sea. The sea is somehow an ahistorical void where history doesn't happen. But of course, I spent my whole life studying how history happens at sea, how class formation happens at sea, mm -hmm. how race formation happens at sea, how 
culture formation happens at sea. All these things we know. So I do think there is this deeply uh, uninspected bias in our modern way of thinking that we just don't think of the oceans as real places and real places of human struggle. Okay? So I think that's the fourth. So let me also pose the question, why does it matter? I think there are three reasons why knowing about these maritime escapees matter. First of all, they help us to rethink how running away actually worked, or in my case, how sailing away actually worked. The dominant image of runaways, and it's presented right here because these two would never appear together, is that it was an individual act. An individual act of heroism. <coughs> And in many cases, that's exactly what it was. But what it does is that that image prevents us from seeing that running away was a collective process. Mm -hmm. You couldn't really do it by yourself. If you tried, you were much more likely to get captured and return to slavery where you would pay the price with the flesh on your back. Runaways were almost always whipped brutally mm -hmm. to terrify everybody else. So, but it's not only, folks, that it's a collective act. It's a collective act within the maritime working class. It's sailors, it's dock workers, it's market women. None of these people are elites. They're not elites. They're ordinary working people but their labor places them in a position to be able to do this subversive work. And very subversive it is. So we need to rethink how escape actually works and think about it as a cooperative and collective process. So that's one reason why it matters. The second reason why it matters, and I go back to an earlier point, one of the things that historians love to debate these days is the relationship between structure and agency, right? Some people want structural explanations of how things happen. Other people want a more human-centered, collectivist idea of how people make change. This shows that those two things go together. That the structure of trade made possible the agency of resistance. So this locates resistance within particular structures of the rise of capitalism. I think that helps us to understand both things a little better, both the structure and the resistance. Yeah. And the third thing, <clears throat> this helps us to rethink abolitionism from below. Now, the dominant story that has been told for the last 200 years about abolitionism was that it was the wise work of enlightened gentlemen. Products of the Enlightenment. Middle and upper class men, like William Wilberforce. I don't take anything away from William Wilberforce, although you should know that he wrote all of the anti-labor legislation yeah. in late 18th century England. Uh, but now we see, and and there's been a lot of work done on this in addition to my own. Now we see that ordinary people have a great deal to do with this system of running away, which is one of the main causes of the coming of the Civil War. I call it, for the South, death by a thousand cuts. Because it was thousands and thousands of people who ran away. And those people, as they ran away, educated the northern abolitionists about the nature of slavery. My former student, uh, Jesse Olsovsky, wrote a, a brilliant book about this, that these fugitives who show up in the abolitionist offices, they explain what slavery really is. Most white abolitionists had never been in the South. They had never seen what slavery actually was. So they make it, make it real for them. Okay, so, so that's very important. But we've got to think now about the fugitives, the doctors, the sailors, the market women, and we've got to see resistance to slavery as closely linked to the rise of abolitionism, right? Abolitionism from below. 
This is the third book I've written on that subject. So in the end, I say that an unknown man like William Powell, a sailor abolitionist, and an unknown man like named Mahama Bakwakwa, a sailor fugitive, those people are agents of history. Unknown, but powerful agents of history. That is an important connection. They help to make a cataclysmic change in American history that will bring slavery to an end. With the help of workers of many kinds, fugitives transgressed borders, and the motley crew made history. Thank you very much. <coughs>
So you do, the, the resistance is inscribed in the advertisements. And that's a crucial body of sources. And then, I should have said, abolitionists, black and white abolitionists, in the northern ports are keeping records of the runaways that they assist. There's a black abolitionist named William Still in Philadelphia who takes down the stories of more than 900 people he helped to escape to freedom. And many of these people tell unbelievably detailed stories about their lives mm -hmm. and specifically about how they escaped. Now, William Still, in doing this, was running the risk of prison. It was after the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. It was a major felony to help anyone who ran away. So he had to hide these records in a barn, right? But then after the Civil War, he went back to those records and he published a big fat book called The Underground Railroad with all of these stories transcribed. And sometimes the stories that he writes down are maddening. For example, especially on the issue of women. He'll say things like, this woman suffered things too horrible to be written down. But there were other cases where he did take down a story and talked about sexual abuse. And then there is, a, the, one of the chapters of my book is about a woman named Harriet Jacobs, who wrote the first major expose of the violent treatment and sexual abuse of enslaved women, published in 1862. She actually escaped in 1842, right? And she escaped by sea because her brother and all three of her uncles were sailors. But she gives a searing account of how the experience of women under slavery was different. It was different than that of men. Uh, and she fought her enslaver tooth and nail every step of the way. Uh, and it was a victory that he never was able to rape her. Never happened. And she got away. And she told the story. So that is critical. But I will also say that when you get to, well, when you try to tell the story of poor people, those people live in a shadow. If you're black and poor, you're a shadow within a shadow. And if you're a black woman, who is poor, you're a shadow within a shadow within a shadow. So this is the most difficult subject to do research on, by far. But there is a fair amount of material, and I'm, 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 it's, to me it's an interesting fact that a higher percentage of the successful maritime runaways were women than was the case among the landed runaways. Partly that's because women wanted to go with their children. If you have to take children over hundreds of miles by land, you're very likely to get caught. If you have someone on board a ship who's going to protect you, you get on board that ship and you step off the ship in a, in a free space, a free land, that's a much better situation for women, and, and women did take advantage of it. We also see the role of women in caring for fugitives who are trying to get on board the ships. There was a secret society of women. This, this I think, is fascinating. A secret society of women in Charleston, South Carolina, who were basically an organized society to help runaways get on board these ships. And that group still exists to this day. It's called the United Order of Tents. So, so this has been a, a, a special struggle, but I do think it's possible to know more than we thought we would be able to learn. And then finally, to come back to the, the narratives. There are, I, I think the latest count is that there are 103 narratives written by enslaved people who escaped. Some of these were published during the time when slavery was still um, powerful, still legal. Frederick Douglass was one of those. 
Uh, some of them were published after the Civil War, when it was much safer to talk about what had happened to you, right? Of those 103, around 70 of them make reference to ocean-going ships. It's a very high percentage. Uh, the, the other thing I would say is that when I started this work, I thought there was a single, singular, maritime underground railroad, but it turns out there are five of them. There are five of them. There is, the, there is a Gulf Coast Caribbean route of escape based out of New Orleans. There is a Mississippi River escape also that ends in New Orleans. There is an, an Ohio River escape that goes from Pittsburgh to St. Louis. And there is a Great Lakes system, especially after 1850, when people are trying to get to Canada. So I'm just doing the Atlantic one. There are, all, there are like four other books out there waiting for somebody <laughs> to write. And this thing is just so much bigger than we realize. But once you, you, know, once you scratch the surface, mm -hmm. you start yeah. getting into the sources, you see that water was really critical to so many of these escapes. Mm -hmm. So the, the sources have been... Uh, Many and various, you have to search you know, high and low if you want to do history from below, but I'd had a little practice in that before I came to this. <laughs> you know, the, the ultimate challenge of that was to try to understand what was going on in the lower decks of slave ships, because those people left almost no documents. So, uh, but here we do actually frequently get documents in the voice of the enslaved people. Now, white abolitionists usually take down those stories. And so they are mediated. Mm. They are somewhat mediated, but I still think you can hear the original fugitive in most of those accounts. Um, no sé si um, eh, alguien tiene alguna duda con lo que um, explicó Marcus. Yo creo que fue <laughs> muy largo, ¿no? Pero, pero bueno, quizás... Uh, si necesitan traducción, en principio, I think that most people have, have understood you. <coughs> sí, sí, adelante. No, 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 si no, si no hablan en español y después te lo traducimos, sí, en serio. <laughs> Dale. <laughs> Yeah. 
bueno, no sé, si mucho, ahora a ver que no se trata y justamente hago un para un poco para si podemos traducir sí por favor hasta luego gracias ya 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 perdón this question is um, have you looked at cases in cities that aren't U.S. cities for instance cities that aren't U.S. cities that you mentioned and do you have the intention of doing that 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 you know What happened to some of these people who ran away or stowed away on these on these boats? Did they did they remain working on the boats as seamen and sailors? Mm -hmm. um, did they stay in U.S. cities, or did any of them ever try to get back to Africa? Mm -hmm. Assuming they had been working on them, and then the last uh, comment was that. Um, Tina said that she has been working on following uh, runaway slave advertisements here in Argentina and also mm -hmm. judicial cases. She came across one case in which there was a man, it's a case in Gustav Key, in Gustav Key, and there was a case here in the previous year of a man who um, had stowed away uh, or had run away, uh, who was originally. Se cae acá. And that's when I was slave returned to Boston. So it's more interesting mm -hmm. for a bit because mm -hmm. one can think that he will be uh, up as far as, as he can from, from, the, right. uh, from the place. Yes. Right. Yeah, okay. sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the first thing I would say is that working at sea had been a route to freedom for a lot of people for a long time. The famous story of Alauda Equiano, who uh, he was a man from uh, present-day Nigeria, uh, who gave an account of being shipped on a slaving vessel when he was around 11 years old. Alauda Equiano worked his way to freedom on board a ship, and so this was very, very common. It's also true that a lot of formerly enslaved people, the only jobs they could get were on ships because there was no regulation, no guild regulation, no artisanal control. And so consequently, some enslaved people, formerly enslaved people, ended up working on slave ships. Horrible though that sounds. A few of them did it in order to return to Africa. But the people that I'm writing about were almost all born in the United States. The, the slave trade technically ended in 1808, although it went on illegally for a while thereafter. But these were people who, for example, were opposed to the colonization movement, taking people back to Liberia because they said, we built this country, the United States, this is our country, give us our rights, we will stay here, we're not going anywhere. So, so there's a really a, a powerful feeling that, um, that their labor had built the wealth of the United States. So I think that's, uh, that, that's one significant uh, point. Remind me of the first question. Okay, yes. 
If I'd had ten more years. <laughs> twenty, twenty or thirty. <laughs> I only spent five years on this book, um, and I had to do only one of the five underground or maritime systems of escape. But yes, it would be fascinating to know because I do have individual cases of people escaping in Charleston and then going to a Caribbean island. Uh, I do have a number of cases of people getting on board a ship bound for New York and they go on with the cotton to Liverpool because that's where the Liverpool was going. So I think the same principle of following the routes of trade would lead you to find where people had gone when they escaped aboard the ship. But the great density of the body of evidence is for these North American ports. Uh, so I, I followed the other sources wherever I could, but it ended up being a much more North American story than I myself had expected when I began, but that was primarily because of the structure of trade. That's where the opportunities were to get out of those southern ports to a northern port. Now, uh, what happened to people afterwards? Uh, some became sailors. I found a couple of very moving instances of someone who ends up in jail in the South because he had told someone that he had escaped by sea several years before and now he had come back to get his family members. But they caught him. So some did escape by sea and remain a sailor and come back and try to do the same work of resistance. Uh, many, many more tried to get other jobs on the waterfront the safest place was Boston or, New, or, New, or uh, New Bedford. The New Bedford free black community was unbelievably militant. Mm. They would kill slave catchers. They would kill slave catchers. And slave catchers knew it. And they didn't want to go there. And Boston, because it had the strongest abolitionist community, was also a relatively safe place. But in 1850, when this fugitive slave law made it legally binding that northern people had to help, assist, help return slaves to the south, runaways to the south. A lot of people even left New Bedford and Boston to go to Canada because slavery had been abolished in the British Empire. Now, many of those people uh, found work there. They got land there. Mm -hmm. uh, but many of them came back after the Civil War. So that Canada was a real liberated zone for people after 1850. I'd say 10 to 20,000 people went there during that decade. So that's, and, and that's, the, that's the story of how they survived because there were some very high profile cases in which the uh, federal government spent unbelievable amounts of money to capture uh, a runaway and bring that person back. The most famous example is a, a, a maritime runaway named Anthony Burns mm -hmm. from uh, Richmond, Virginia. There was such a fight over Anthony Burns in Boston where all of the abolitionists rallied around. It took a massive deployment of military force to march him two blocks from the jail to the ship. I'm talking about thousands of soldiers to protect him from the mob that wanted to liberate him, it was estimated that it cost $40,000. This would be more than a million dollars in, in today's currency. And that was not a viable model. And so basically, after that, they stopped trying in Massachusetts, in Boston, to bring back fugitives because it was just too expensive. So that, that's the kind of thing that's going on. But the federal government, with that bill, put all of its power behind the slave-owning ruling class to return their runaway property. But abolitionists and fugitives effectively nullified that law. Did I get to all the different parts of the different questions? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No sé si alguna otra pregunta. Estamos bien, entonces. Está, está un poco frío, la verdad, acá tenemos que haber ido a la otra.
It's, it's a bit cold here. <laughs> I, I think we, 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 we should be in the other room. Uh, so, eh, vamos entonces a ir terminando. Les agradezco muchísimo. Many thanks. Many, many, many thanks because uh, I think that we all learn a lot from, from, your, you. from your talk. Yeah. Eh, le vamos a dar entonces un gran aplauso a Marcus. Yeah. Thanks all of you.